When Frank Lloyd Wright was just nine years old, his mother purchased him a set of blocks to play with. Anna Lloyd-Jones hoped that her son would grow up to be a great architect, and she thought the creativity unlocked in practice with these blocks could kickstart his journey. Ever after, Wright was able to see and arrange geometric patterns in alignment with nature. By the time Wright attempted to design his first building, years later, he spent countless hours stacking and arranging the blocks. He had hands-on experience observing the effects of proportion and symmetry, balance, and other principles of design well before he ever picked up a pencil. Frank Lloyd Wright had developed tools that prepared him to perform well at the next stages of his architectural career. And in one sense, the opportunity to practice something that would benefit him later on, those sorts of things are out of his direct control. It has to do with when and where he was born and other external circumstances. Sometimes opportunities to call on previously honed skills is a result of chance and serendipity. Attributing Wright's success to his opportunities to repair is a much more complex narrative than just the one that he was born as some innate genius with skills and aptitudes that are inaccessible to the average person like you and me. Instead, he got good at things, good at things that proved valuable later on, and he made decisions that set him up to encounter future obstacles with practiced skills. Acknowledging the role of chance and external factors in Wright's success shouldn't take away from our appreciation for his architecture or his achievements. But by understanding the context that Wright was navigating, I think that we can learn from the decisions that he's made. It's much more relatable and even closer to reality than attributing his success to a mysterious and innate talent alone. Of course, we can't draw a straight line from wooden blocks at the start of his career to the Guggenheim that bookended it. There had to be a series of these moments in Wright's life where the skills he practiced became unexpectedly valuable and accelerated Wright ahead of his peers. Here's where I think they are. Frank Lloyd Wright was born in 1867, and he lived for 91 years. 70 of those were dedicated to designing buildings. Let's divide this span of time into three parts. Each one comes with their own set of contexts. The first era contains the events that led up to Wright establishing his own practice in 1893. The second era contains the bulk of his architecture career. And the third is his late career and legacy. Such a long, productive life, spanning the turn of the 20th century, encompasses enormously significant events like world wars and technological inventions. From the candlelit offices of Adler and Sullivan to the sprawling Arizona headquarters at Taliesin West, Wright's career evolves as he takes advantage of rapid changes in how we live, as well as significant shifts in our culture and the economy. It's within this turbulence that Wright was able to find new ways to practice as an architect and to become the preeminent cultural figure that we know today. Wright was born in Richland Center, Wisconsin. At the age of 19, he was admitted to the University of Wisconsin in Madison as a special student, where he attended for two semesters. He studied drafting under Alan Conover, a professor of civil engineering. Wright wasn't particularly a conscientious student. Apparently, he rarely attended class. He was there long enough, though, to learn how to draft from his civil engineering tutor, but not long enough to earn a degree. Instead, Wright got his foot in the door of architecture through family connections back at home. Wright's uncle was a prominent Unitarian minister, and he needed a new chapel for his congregation in Spring Green, Wisconsin. Jenkins Lloyd-Jones commissioned a Chicago architect for the project, and he appointed his nephew to oversee matters of the interior. Young Wright performed well enough in his advisory role that the chapel's architect, Joseph Lyman Silsby, officially hired Wright after construction. Silsby was a fantastic architect of houses and smaller institutional structures. He also happened to be a professor that taught architecture at some of the finest schools in the country. While Wright never officially attended architecture school, his first job was, ended up being a, a close corollary. And the skills and the techniques that Wright learned while working for Silsby would show up throughout his career. Take the chapel, for instance. It's in a style named for its shingled exterior walls. Shingle-style homes have a particular cross-shaped layout that Wright would adapt in his early designs. Secondly, the shingled exterior creates a peculiar relationship between the roof and the facade. This building, to me at least, reads like a stone foundation with a giant roof. The middle portion looks like it's designed to visually recede into the background. The same is true for the interior, with the wood on the bottom and top, and the blank band in the middle. This style of building later morphed into the prairie style, pioneered by people like Silsby, Wright, and others that worked for Silsby. 
The prairie style exaggerates the roof overhang to the degree that the walls seem to disappear, like in the Roby house here, for instance. So Silsby provided Wright's initial architectural education after the blocks and the drawing. But there was another benefit that probably did even more to shape Wright's career. It brought him to Chicago, the city, rebuilding from the great fire that wiped everything away only 20 years earlier. Chicago was emerging as a new, modern metropolis from the ashes. Architects and construction could barely keep pace. Wright's second job took him to the office of Adler and Sullivan. Unlike Silsby, that firm specialized in the largest and the most avant-garde buildings there were, skyscrapers. Adler and Sullivan were central to the rebuilding of Chicago and true pioneers as they experimented in every single project with new ways of developing and incorporating new technologies. Steel frames, terracotta facades, these would become the standards for how we would think about tall structures ever since. However, Wright's expertise until this point was designing interiors, not soaring vertical towers. But he made it work. He was responsible for the office's most ambitious interiors in big buildings, like the Auditorium Building from 1889. Here, the street, lobby, and the auditorium space flow seamlessly together through arches and stairs. The building is so heavy that it sank three feet into the ground after construction, but somehow, Frank Lloyd Wright was able to make it feel weightless as soon as you walk in. The trick of compressing the space down vertically, only to release it later, became a staple of Wright's work. Wright was put in charge of a few houses while he was at the firm as well. This is the Charnley Persky House, designed by Louis Sullivan and Frank Lloyd Wright in 1892. James Charnley was a lumber magnate that knew Sullivan from parties and other high society events around town. And this house features a number of Wright's signature moves, including the central fireplace, the low-slung connections between the spaces and rooms, and the simple geometric motifs that you'll find in the woodwork. Adler and Sullivan didn't design very many houses like this, while their head draftsman, Frank Lloyd Wright, loved designing them. So much so that he took extra commissions after hours that he would keep for himself. Louis Sullivan discovered this and asked Wright to choose the office or the side work. Wright bet on himself and set up shop in nearby Oak Park in 1893. So the most ambitious architects in Chicago were focusing on big commercial buildings downtown. But with all of the new wealth that was generated by the manufacturing, a new class of client was emerging. And they didn't want the same traditional style homes that architects were making at the time. And Wright, in this case, offered something almost completely unique. The modern, forward-thinking attitude of practices like Sullivan's, coupled with the attention to detail and the interiors from someone, say, like Silsby. One of Wright's early employees was Marion Mahoney Griffin. She was the first licensed female architect in the world. She was fascinated by woodblock prints from Japan. She even developed a unique way of drawing and rendering buildings that borrowed from the style. This is the drawing she made for the design of the Ward Willits House, a beautiful soft perspective of the prairie style design in nearby Highland Park. Wright also came to appreciate the aesthetic of these Japanese artifacts, and it didn't hurt that his office was becoming pretty well known for that style of drawing that Marion helped develop. Once the office was strong enough to run without him for a bit, he decided to go to Japan to see it for himself. So along with Ward and Cecilia Willits, the clients of the Ward Willits house, Wright traveled to Japan in 1905. He spent three months photographing the landscapes and temples. The influence on the work was immediate. Most academically trained architects at this time would have chosen to travel to Europe to study classical architecture. So the uniqueness of the Japanese elements in the American context are pretty easy to identify. The first building that he started working on upon his return it was Unity Temple. The plan for Unity Temple is almost identical to a Japanese temple, with both sharing a binuclear layout of two main areas with a smaller connection between. He also chose a truly unique material for Unity Temple. It's made almost entirely from reinforced concrete. Technically, reinforced concrete had been invented about 50 years prior, but architects didn't really know what to do with it yet. The first concrete house ever just looks like a normal house, but made of concrete. But the material holds so much more promise than that. Even at Unity Temple, the choice was made largely just to save on costs. A, a single mold could be used to achieve all the repetitive detail work. No longer would a craftsman need to make each instance by hand. But again, this represents only a fraction of the possibilities of the new kinds of architectural forms that reinforced concrete offers. 
Wright was in on the ground floor of a technology that could completely transform what buildings could do. Soaring cantilevers, graceful curves. Some of his most famous buildings like Falling Water or the Guggenheim would never have been possible without the capabilities of reinforced concrete. As an early adopter, his explorations serve as a reference for all explorations since. But there's also another hugely significant historical development that makes Wright's work seem almost prophetic. As the suburbs began spreading across the United States, starting in the 1940s and 50s, Wright's work provided a roadmap for how to think about them. His visionary developments like Broadacre City explored concepts that would become the suburbs that we know today. Long roads and huge expanses of land devoted primarily to residential construction. Each home with an acre of land. These were Wright's dreams. This was Wright's utopian vision and it reflected his ideals even in his design for single homes. His Usonian series of homes, modeled by the Jacobs House for instance, provided a small, single-level, inexpensive house for a small family. And many attribute the development of such basic and ubiquitous house styles, such as the ranch style or the split level, as coming directly from Wright's design work and ideas. He thought of these early, before the United States needed them so fully. Ranch style homes or split levels from the 1970s, which can be found everywhere, are said to have evolved from Wright's initial work from years before. The turn to build endless suburbs in the United States after World War II built heavily on Wright's ideas and almost every single house inside of a post-war suburb bears his trace. This broad applicability and usefulness of his ideas came decades after he developed them, and they were instituted in ways that he could have never foreseen. Nonetheless, their broad delivery keeps Wright and his work in our minds. Wright also made sure that he remained visible through newly developing forms of mass media throughout his lifetime. As new kinds of printed media like magazines, radio, film, or television became available, Wright was there to engage them. He was prepared to use what he had learned to take advantage of these new opportunities throughout his 70-year career. So I want to say it just to be clear. Wright was a fantastic architect and a shrewd thinker. To pay special attention to his context like this is in no way diminishing his skill. These factors, too, are not the only ones that I would attribute to the broad popularity and appeal. For instance, Wright also ran his practice like a school, training apprentices that lived with him. Teaching your concepts and techniques to others, it significantly magnifies the reach of their influence. This is maybe something that he learned from Silsby. Conversely, Wright had a supremely tumultuous career with very low points marked by tragedies that would have sidelined anyone with less grit than Wright. But this lens of appreciating external opportunities and how significant figures benefited from them, I think it's useful overall. I'm clearly inspired by Malcolm Gladwell's Outliers, The Story of Success. Through this way of looking at things, figures like Wright seized opportunities with skills that they had honed over years in one context, which serendipitously gives them a huge advantage in another context. Without a family hiring an architect, without moving to Chicago, without the tutelage of two important architects, without an employee bringing a taste of Japan to the office, and without new materials and new forms of mass media, Frank Lloyd Wright's works would never have been possible. But of course, without Frank Lloyd Wright, they wouldn't have been possible either. Frank Lloyd Wright loved being in the spotlight, inviting students and clients into his home and his private life all the time. I'm a little bit more private, and I'd prefer my personal information to just stay out of the public domain. And that's why I signed up for Incogni, this video's sponsor. You might not know it, but there are hundreds of data brokers that possess and sell your personal data right now, and the numbers are growing every single year. These data brokers have your name, your address, phone number, shopping habits, possibly even your social security number, all for the highest bidder. I know that when I checked, there were literally hundreds of different companies that had this information. Best case scenario is that this just leads to scam calls, but at the worst, identity theft and doxing. But Incogni fights on your behalf to remove your personal data from data brokers and deals with any objections from their side. All you have to do is create an account and then give them approval to work on your behalf. And Cogni will work continuously on getting this information scrubbed from databases because even if the broker removes your data once, they could just collect it again. And Cogni makes sure that your personal information stays off the market for good. When I signed up, I saw a huge decrease in the number of spam emails and calls that I was getting. And it was also just kind of terrifying to see exactly how many brokers have your data. And it's really fun to watch Incogni get them to delete that info one by one. If they put up a fight in this, Incogni will fight back and send repeated letters on your behalf until the information is gone. 
So if you'd like to give Incogni a try, click on the link down below to get 60% off Incogni when you use the code Stuart Hicks. Again, it's 60% off. Just click on the link that's on the screen right now or down in the description and use the code Stuart Hicks. Stay safe out there. And as always, thanks for watching.